very important job of um, teaching the uh, School Calisthenics fraternity style uh, Marbella handshake and it's even more important this year because you're the second group and there is a, there's a distinct possibility that you may meet someone at some point that you haven't seen before but actually they came on the School Calisthenics last year and then there's another group coming in October and it might be that you see someone and they've got the vest on and you're like, does he look like a dude that would buy that vest or has he been to Marbella and got one for, for, for free because he came on the trip? And you might, it, it, you, you gotta give, there's like a little look of like, <laughs> because it might be and I'm like, that looks like a chump that would buy a t-shirt. And I come in and the safety is like, we can just hang, oh hi, yeah, it's a cool cast, oh right, yeah, cool, yeah, nice. I actually went to my bank, got mine for free, but oh, and he's like, oh yeah, no, I saw that trip, I'd like to go on that. Or it might be that we see each other and he's like, I give him the eyebrows, and it, come, and it looks like we're just doing a handshake, but we come in, we slide past, we come, we double tap, and we fist bump, <laughs> because we know we've been on the school cast. And so that so that is the handshake. Um, so we'll go through slowly for you. It's, <laughs> it starts with, it starts with an acknowledgement that you both know what's going on. But remember that if you maybe he just fancies me and he's given me those and we come in, you've always got the get out. Oh, yes. <laughs> you've, you've, got, you've got the get out that he th and then oh, you, can, you can always just hit the, with the handshake. But what we're going to do, we're going to come in, we slide past and you can give him a little bit of something <laughs> extra if you want. So, boom, boom. And then you can be a bit of exp um, expressive interpretation of how you want to finish, <laughs> finish that. So quickly, pair it with someone you didn't come with, if you came with anybody. Or someone new that you haven't spoken to too much yet. <laughs> From that yeah. One of the things I love about handstand or hand balancing is there is so much variability. There's so much progression where you can do a handstand, there's a handstand push-up, or there's a single arm handstand, or there's a forearm balance, which we'll do tomorrow. Like there's lots and lots of different things you can press, you can pike, whatever. And just to add like the the whole premise of why Tim's it like talking about how he'd sort of dislocated in that overhead position, and there was a a thought process to go, like the idea of going, well let's just then go and put myself in that position and just see what happens. It wasn't that would actually sound sounds a little bit like crazy, like why would you do that? But it was a it was like a thought ex like uh, all of Einstein, all of Einstein's like theories come from thought experiments of like having an idea, not actually physically doing an experiment, having an idea, thinking about what the outcomes would be and then literally came up with all this stuff from that. And the, the thought experiment was if I can create stability in this overhead position, can I get better control of the shoulder joint and therefore stop it from um, dislocating in this position? The difference to, from Einstein of Tim is, I would say then, better, because he went and physically then went and tested that thing out. And case in point, you haven't dislocated your shoulder since. So um, the sort of proofs in the pudding in that respect of the actually giving, uh, giving that, that, that stability around the shoulder joint and the control um, in a ex relatively extreme position for the shoulder um, overhead and that also then why it's so such an important move for us to learn it carries over into so many different things not just physically around the sort of robustness of the shoulder in that position that you're going to need for our human flag later but also the ability to control your body whilst you're upside down that spatial awareness the ability to to learn how to uh, balance on your hands which is a completely different skill from a motor learning perspective that you all learn how to do with your feet when we were kids without any coaching, no reps and sets, no program to follow, you didn't do no online training to learn how to, to learn to walk. But we might, as adults, going through that same process, it's a little bit different because we've got 30, 40, however old you are, years of baggage of trying to, now I'm going to learn this new thing. Um, but it takes you, it, if you carry on that journey to learn to do that handstand, you get, you get so much from that, both physically and mentally. Um, which we believe and have experienced ourselves to be a very positive thing for you that you can use moving forward in lots of things you want to tackle, whether it's in your training or even outside of training, things you want to tackle in life, in business, whatever. Um, so there's a lot of value, we believe there's a lot of value in it. So we're going to take you through a bit of a process that will start here where there are no walls and we're going to look at the, the bottom up 
how to get used to balancing our hands and then how we build that up and the, the strength element um, and aspects of that to be able to get up. We'll go back then down to, to do the sort of the uh, top down. So we will use the wall and then we'll look at how we link that sort of together in the middle. Um, and we can look at a few different variations, but predominantly we're going to base it around this, this frog to handstand. And a little bit of the story of that, Tim started from with that process and when I was uh, joined him in that, like we didn't really know each other before we started working together um, from, a, an S, from our strength conditioning perspective. And, we were playing about with calisthenics, I saw him doing that and he was wanting to do handstands and I'd finished playing rugby, I was bored of the weights that I was doing, I was doing the same weight training that I did when I was playing rugby but I wasn't playing anymore and I sort of had this realisation of, what's the point, I could just do something different, Tim was messing about with handstands um, and I'm like well, I'm just going to kick up into that, like, I'd like to do a handstand as well, that'd be quite cool, I'm going to kick up into handstand and I spent, I don't know how many months, kicking up, kicking up, Tim, did you see that one? I held it for like 0.1 of a second. He's like, no, you're now lying on the floor again, Jacko. <laughs> and realised that uh, even once he'd got then into his handstand, getting up there in a strength way from that frog stand, and then wanted to try and do handstand push-ups, and he built strength doing that, and all I'd done is kicked up, I then realised when I started to want to come down, I got no strength. I haven't earned any strength in anything outside of being arm straight and then went back to the start and then like started this process virtually again um, from that. And that is something that we, as I say again, from personal experience, like taking, that's why we're gonna take you through this process rather than just heaps of kick-ups. If you do just wanna learn how to do a kick-up and hold a, a kick-up handstand, like that's cool. Um, but if you wanna build some strength of how to get there then, we need a slightly different approach. And we'll be doing some kick-ups when we use the wall, actually kick up to get there and bypass the strength so we're not just goosed every time we're trying to do something. Because if you want to be able to do a handstand, you need to be able to hold that position. Or if you want to do a frog to handstand, you need the strength to get there, but you also need the, the balance and the control and, and that good position whilst your arms are straight. So we do need a bit of a bit of both, but we're going to focus a lot on how we get there from a strength perspective. Uh, so first, let's just come, come down, come, let's just loosen the wrist. One thing we didn't talk about yesterday, particular movement prep was wrist because we didn't necessarily need to um, and all I want us to do is just we're going to obviously take all of our weight on our on our hands when we're going into handstands and I just want you to start to just move your hands around in different positions and you should feel like when your fingers point more behind you you're going to feel a bit of a stretch more on your forearms there and it's a lot of the time if we're doing any uh, like any gripping work where these flexors are working super hard, particularly if you're false gripping rings for, for ring muscle-ups, everything that gets tight here on the, the flexor side is going to restrict us getting into that extension. I want to be able to create a position where at least I can create a vertical position with my forearm, so create 90 degrees at the wrist. Ideally, I might even want to be able to come a little bit further forward so I can offset some of the balance that I'll need later or counterbalance that I'll need later in that sort of some of those frog stand positions. So, moving the hands around, don't, don't try to rip anything off, just start to feel and then take a little bit more weight on one side to the other and just encouraging just gently a little bit of uh, new range. Look at what happens if I go side on so you can see. Just lean forward, not letting the base of the palm come off and just take a little bit of weight. You're gonna feel a little bit more um, pressure going through the front of the wrist when we go into that shape and just a little bit explore, a little bit side to side. Everyone's gonna feel a little bit of tightness in different positions. So just have a feel of what it's like for you. And then last one that's quite nice to do is one at a time where fingers pointing back if you can, hand goes on top. If you do, everyone just do the right arm because I can then explain it to you easier. So right hand down, left hand on top. I'm then gonna, um, wind so i'm going to go uh, anti-clockwise with my wrist so wind that up and then try and sit back and you'll feel a pretty intense stretch there maintain the base of the palm on the floor rather than if i don't wind it up <coughs> i'm losing a little bit of that tension we talked a time we talked to, uh, talked a tiny bit about like being mindful with our movement yesterday even like a, something as simple as your wrist we can do the same thing we're going to need to be pretty mindful and present in our handstand practice because if you're not focused on exactly what we need to be doing because there's so much going on then uh, you're not going to be uh, you're not setting yourself up for that success
Yep. So we're going to revisit some of the prep work we did yesterday and just build upon that for, um, for our handstands. If we're tight around the front of the shoulders, yeah, the chest, anterior delt, it's going, to it's going to make it difficult for us to get into good overhead positions because when the shoulders are rounded forward, we've not got the shoulder blade, uh, so yeah, the shoulder blade, the scapula and the humeral head in, in a good postural position to allow us into a good overhead shape. So we could go into that seated um, extension position. The hands go go behind your back. Peel the shoulder blades back together. Start to squeeze the shoulder blades so we get some activation at the back. And then we're not gonna we're gonna try and make this as little about being static as possible. So we're gonna get us bum up off the floor. We're gonna start moving in and out of that position the whole time, not letting the ear uh, the shoulders be sort of shrugged up by the ears. Drive those shoulder blades down, move apart, and then as you start to feel good in some of these positions, just change it onto one side and get a little bit of movement away. Keep pushing the floor down, keep pushing yourself up and then I'd like us to see whether we can start to I come on, if you have a little, just have a little break and look. So I'm on that one arm, I'm trying to push this away and up, and I want to see, can I start to drive with hips, go past neutral, and can I start to get some extension through my spine? I wanna try and get that extension coming as much as I can through the thoracic spine. We need thoracic extension to be able to get good arms overhead. And then just encouraging, what does that look like? A little bit of a single arm bridge type of shape, and then swap. Then go on to the other side. One then just for the wrist position. Rather than hands being behind the back, you're going to put them behind the So rather than being be facing behind you, hands are still going to go behind the back, but you're going to have your fingers pointing forward. You're going to feel this more than on your wrist. We're going to do then the same thing. Again, look, shoulders are forward. I've got to squeeze them back. Don't let them slump by ears. Drive the floor down, push away and then can I encourage myself forward in that position still. You're going to feel, should feel even a little bit forward down the forearms as you go forward. Keep the base of the palm flat on the floor, but it's just encouraging a little bit more through the wrists. Nice. Do the same on one arm. Just be super progressive with it. Anyone do any bridges or wheels? It's just a nice, in terms of trying to get that arms overhead, shoulders in a nice overhead position and that upper back, trying to get into an extended shape. So you can build up, if you want, you stick with the single arm progression, if you can't. Nice. Even just starting to get up there. Nice, and then my, I'll just give it, this have been enjoying these recently, where I'm trying to do everything, linking all that together, so that single arm, that bridge, but then coming round into the other one. Trying to actively be and getting good at pushing out and away, then having that control and stuff on one, on one side. But the idea is, for me to get decent overhead position, I've got to not only change what's happening at the shoulder, I want to be able to extend that spine so I can get into a better overhead shape. The better overhead shape I can get, the better that I've got an opportunity in my handstand to create a better shape. If I can't create a good shape standing up because my shoulders are tight in terms of the actual shoulder here, but a lot of what goes on is what's happening at the spine as well. That if I can't extend that thoracic, that's, think that your shoulder blades are sat on your rib cage, and your rib cage is dictated by where your spine is. So if my spine is rounded forward at the top, 
all of a sudden I've moved my, my rib cage is in a different position, my scapulas are in a different position, that's going to affect how easy it is to get my arm overhead. The only way, if I'm in a poor position, I make it, I'm over exaggerating it, but if I'm in a poor position here with my spine, what happens to my shoulder, being forward, as far as I can get my arm up is about here, so the only way my hand goes over my head for a handstand is to change, make the change at the hip here to allow that shape. And I don't really want to be in that type of shape when I'm doing my handstands, yeah? Not only from uh, it looking nice, I'm also putting the shoulder in a compromised position. If anyone's ever had any like pain around and impingement around the front of the shoulder, a lot of the time it's to do with that humeral head being at the front and pushing on some of the tendons and tissue at the front of here that we don't really want to be jamming apart. We want to have a nice shape for um, the articulation of the shoulder to allow us for good movement, but also pain-free and good quality movement. Yeah. So we all people talk about core, so let's just define what we're talking about to start off with. It comes with us in the different headings. So effectively, if, if, I was a, if I was a cadaver or a dead body, and you were going to chop off anything that wasn't core, what would you chop off? Your biceps. Head. Whereabouts? Head and knees. Head would go. Yeah, agree? Arms. Arms where? Legs. Where? All of it. Oh, no, you would, you would yeah. you, you chop us. You would chop us. You would chop us. Yeah. There's the muscle attached to the spine is core. Going to be number four. Going to be number four. So for any musculature which is attached to the pelvis or spine is defined technically as core. So rather than core being here, think about the pillar of strength and stability. So we could lose this bit and we could lose that bit. Everything else is attached into the midsection or to the spine or the pelvis. The important part about this is the midsection or our spinal stability is super important in transferring forces to the chain. If we're going to do, let's say for example, it's, it's a bit different, but if I was going to throw a ball, force generation roughly from the body is going to come from 50% lower body, the so box is going to throw a punch, it's going to 50, 30 from the midsection to the rotation, and probably about 20 from the shoulder. So our ability to transfer forces is, is, is significant. And the same thing if we're going to go handstand, push up, human flag, the force is now coming from here, but if I haven't got spinal stability through my core, then I can't transfer those forces into the feet. So again, calisthenics is an example of how it plays to the strengths of how the system is designed to be used. So we're going to have a quick look at uh, just a, some core progressions. Um, to think about the spinal stability, we don't really do any kind of crunch work. You have a stabilization system, which is the musculature, which is close to the spine and the pelvis. And we have a strength-based system, if you want to call it that, which is or global strength, which is more superficial. So the six-pack, your abdominus, um, rex abdominus is going to be more part of our global strength-based musculature. Our deep fibers, like an inter obliques, transverse abdominus, this sort of stuff, low to the spine, that's like a corset around the midsection. That's what we're more interested in. Get that right, and then these big guys that Jacko has been working on for years come as a result of that. But also, if you want to do sit ups, do sit ups, but it's a non functional exercise for a large majority of what we're going to do. So, dead bug position, dead simple. His job is to try and keep his back flat. We can argue about neutral, but we're for, for the purpose of calisthenics, we're going to put the back flat against the floor. So I shouldn't be able to get my hand underneath. He's then going to go and try and take one arm, one leg, so a bit of coordination out, keeping that back flat. Don't let it arch. All that's happening here is we're moving weight away from the midsection, so we can alternate those two. We talked yesterday about maintaining a strong shape. What I don't want Jacko to do in this position is just get dead floppy in between. Like, so we're all about creating tension. So keep these positions nice and strong. Keep thinking that when you go out into that long position, drive the arms and the legs away from each other. Create tension in the chain, because we're going to again do that in our handstand. The next thing he's going to do is bring both hands together. He's going to take arms and legs at the same time. More weight moving away from a center of um, support here. Still trying to keep the back flat. If you get halfway and you find that you can't go any lower and your back starts to arch, just work through the range of movement that you can control. There's no point working through to the ground if your back is arched because you're just train, training a bad position. So be super strict with how you're going to control these positions. The last one then I'm going to go, you guys can work through this progression of three. It's going to be a hold position, a hollow body hold. So he creates this dish shape. So it's now into what, um, a tight body position. Big in gymnastics, but this is how we maintain tension in the midsection. This is going to be muscle up, this is going to be handstand to a certain degree, and some of our other levers. If he can do that, then he can rock. Just give us that fourth, and then we'll kind of play through. Can he then hold that hollow dish position? The important thing here is that backside clears the ground. We shouldn't have the hips on the floor and then just basically just doing a hip flexion movement. 
with the hips moving. Okay, we want to use the lower abdominals to pull the bum off the ground. So go through that little sequence, try single arm dead bug, double arm dead bug, hollow body hold, hollow body rock, and then we'll, we've got a little test for you to see how you can uh, link these together. The difference, you've got your, your full dead bug where both arms and both legs are out, but your upper back is still on the floor. That, that dish position is when you actually then pull the head and the upper back off the floor. Good, just have a, have a quick little rest and then just make a couple of little points for you. Um, so my full, in, my, in my full dead bug, my upper back and my head are on the floor, but I'm taking these, both my levers of my arms and my legs, as far away from the, my sort of center mass of my pivot point as possible. So the further I take them away, the harder it's gonna be. So I can make this slightly easier by not taking them as far and having them at a sort of 45 degree angle. The, the dish position is I'm now pulling ribs down, upper back and head are now off, but I'm trying to make this as hard as possible. They're off the floor, but as close to the floor as possible. So that same principle, taking levers and, and taking them as far away from the point of contact that's on the floor, the pivot point as possible. So I can do my dish, but make it easier by having it much, yeah, deeper, deeper type of dish. So when you go into your rocks, you can create a deeper dish rock, or I could even bend my knees, reduce that lever length a little bit. I could then take my hands and I could bring them in towards the middle. I can still create that motion where it's not slapping down. I'm staying dish, so it's a, it's a constant little rocking motion around your lower back. So have a little play, I want you to feel what that rocking motion is like. So you're caping, a connection. What we, we think that for it, so just, let me just finish. For, uh, for it to be, for it to rock, we must maintain the same shape in that spine. If the spine is moving, then you're not rocking. One more slap, like your back will slap and then your bum will slap and then your back will slap and then your bum will slap because you're changing that position. You're gonna try and maintain the same shape. Just use any one of those progressions to find where you can do sort of like 10 rocks um, in, in, in what feels like a decent shape. Every time you go back, your bum gets picked up off the floor. So someone should be able to slide their hand underneath and not get trapped by you. So what we're gonna need is shoulder range of movement up overhead. We've sorted out lats and we've sorted out, we've sorted out pecs, we've sorted out lats. This position here we talked about yesterday, if he's tight in his shoulders, when he goes overhead, the back's gonna to wanna to arch. So what we've done is we've created a range of movement and we've now told the brain that this is important, that I need you to lock this section down. So we've got this range of movement and muscular coordination to hold the shape. All right, so we're doing all right. Creating the conditions for some success. So we're gonna just take it into um, our, give one last core challenge for you to have a play around with together. So I'm gonna demonstrate jacket song, because you always leave yeah. me hanging on the floor. Well, it's this, this one takes what you were just trying to learn there and, and tests on the fact that how well are you maintaining that structural alignment of your, of your midsection of your trunk. And in our handstand, we're gonna try and make a change at our fingers when we're trying to balance. A lot of that balance and that control comes from there. We're gonna want the, the change that I make here, the pressure, the force that I apply to the floor here to travel all the way through and have be connected to your feet so that you can change your whole body line all the way up to your feet by making some changes here. You can only do that if you've got that uh, connection through the rest of the chain and strong. So this tests a little bit of that and also tests whether you're actually doing a hollow, a decent hollow uh, rock or hollow position or not. So real simple, you're gonna create a hollow body position and then your partner is just gonna put some pressure down on the feet. So when I push down, what we're expecting to see, I have to push quite hard, is that shape to stay the same. What I don't wanna see is a sit up, all right? You're gonna feel like when you're the person being uh, the dish, you're gonna feel like you wanna sit up, but you have to resist it. You actually gotta work quite hard with the hip flexors to maintain that tension. So see if you can have a go at creating that position with your partner, just to push through it. Can you maintain the distance from hands to feet and transfer force to the chest? It'll be quite good when you're being the dish to close your eyes and not try to guess when they're pushing. Your job is stay still. You're effectively pushing your legs up again, trying to resist them. If you resist them and stay tight, they'll move you. Yeah? Something we're gonna cover a lot of 
base of support where his hands are. Balance of anything, not related to hands, but any type of balance. We have to have our centre of mass distributed above our weight of support, our base of support. If his hips are a centre of mass, if his hips are back, gravity is always going to win that battle of that little seesaw that's happening. The shoulders and head are forward, legs are back. He needs to create a position where he's committing forward to have this base of support distribute, sorry, this centre of mass distributed over that base of support. The higher the knees go, the higher that centre of mass goes, puts more force requirement from the shoulders to hold that balance position. Yeah, it's like a strength balance effectively. Yeah? So the higher you put them up, the more you're gonna, you're gonna need that strength. So you can, as Tim said, play around with how high your knees are, where your knees are, to what feels good and what challenges sort of, sort of you. All right, so in that position there, where I want you to have a go back, it feels comfortable. Most of you guys look like you've got a nice little stable shape. It's to start playing around with some variability. So can we start to challenge the system? We won't get stuck into the science of it too much, but the variability in challenging ourselves in different shapes, we're going to do a little bit in a while, is going to be good for starting to broaden out our skill development process. So we're going to start to create variability in the system, which means we ultimately end up with better robustness of the skill or more stable skill. Just reiterate one thing of just your gap on your fingers. A few, few of you were like super flat with your hand, whereas when Tim's, uh, whereas Tim's gripping with the fingertips, see the fingertips go white and there's a little bit of space underneath rather than being completely sort of flat. We want those fingers to be super active. The fingertips when we go into handstands are what gripping down with them is what's going to pull you back when you feel like your legs are going over the top. So you want to get the chance to explore some positions now. And even if we just, just do moving about first, if Tim gets into his whatever comfortable was comfortable for him for his frog stand, and then just tries changing side to side, front to back, and feel, be really mindful about what do my fingers start to do to control me, to stop me going uh, too far. And when we go too far, head kisses the floor, can we come back up? Just start to feel about how, rather than just being in this one rigid position, what happens if I change that position ever so slightly? Because when you get to balancing your handstands, when you see someone that's super good, like an you know, Olympic gymnast, they're just there like bang, but what they're constantly doing is making tiny, tiny, tiny little adjustments, tiny ones that you can barely even see. When we're just starting out and we're new to the journey, the adjustments we make are like boom, down to the floor. And then you have like one time where you go, you're about to go down to the floor, and then you pull it back, but you go boom the other way. And then about a year later, you go that way, and then you go, shit, I'm going too far, and then you pull it back, and then you go, in, I'm going too far that way, and then you pull it back to the middle, and then you pull it back too far, and you go down again. And gradually, it starts to, rather than be like this, it gets smaller, 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 smaller. Yeah, and that's, that's sort of what they call fine motor control. Yeah, so have a play around moving about. In whatever was your most comfortable sort of frog stand position, feel what happens to your fingers. So yeah, have, a, have a rest whenever you need to. Right, let's, so that was changing position a bit. I think we can then, what happens if we use a different surface? So like this mat is much more squidgy than that. So how does it feel when all of a sudden the only thing I'm changing is what my hands are having to sort of grip against? What if we were super flipping crazy? Imagine we were like gnarly surfer dudes and we were like a little bit like, whoa, what happens if I actually had one hand on one thing and one hand on the other, that's a little bit of a different stimulus for me. You've got the grass here, yeah? You could have, a, what does it feel like on this? What does it feel like hand on the grass, hand on that? And just try, just experiment with whatever you've got a little bit around of just feeling some different, exposing a different stimulus to the main thing that's in contact, or the, the only thing that's in contact with the floor. You're yeah. trying to beach later, different Yeah, level. completely different <laughs> on the sand. And then we'll, get, then we'll look at then the strength progression. So, Justin, what's your comfortable frog stand position? Yeah. So, there's, um, let's give you a quick break before we get into the strength stuff. There's three sort of stages of our skill acquisition process. The first one being our cognitive phase, which is typically where quite a few people are going to be. When you're trying to learn a skill for the first time, it takes a significant amount of brain power to focus on what it is that you're trying to learn. You're trying to learn what you're trying to learn, effectively. Progress is really quick though, so in this phase of, of, of skill acquisition, you'll move through from one session to the next, it'll feel rapid because the brain's picking up some really good information, it's starting to put together what it's supposed to do. So that's a really exciting stage. You'll get to the point where you hit the second one, which is our associative phase, where it's actually now, you've, some, of the, some of the basics are under control, but you're having to go through a phase where, where 
progression is much slower, can feel quite difficult and it's quite a long period. But you are starting to understand what it is that you're trying to do and focus on more specific things. So just bear those two things in mind. You eventually arrive at the uh, autonomous phase where you can just do the skill without thinking about it. When you get to that stage, you've then got freedom and capacity to go and think about the other things in particular. So you might want to go and do a handstand push-up. Typically, and these are very broad arbitrary numbers, but they group the number of repetitions together. So cognitive phase is about a thousand repetitions, let's say arbitrary number. It's not going to be necessarily exactly that for everybody, it's going to be very different for that. The second phase of our associative is between 10,000 to 100,000 repetitions. Difficult, long phase, a lot of work. And then if in 100,000 plus, arbitrary number is going to be into our autonomous phase. So when you learn a complex skill like a handstand, just use those numbers to think about how long it's going to take. And that middle ground is where it gets really difficult because you hit plateaus and you've just got to keep going because it's about volume and repetition in that stage. Make sense? Cool. Next one then, let's see if we can start to think about this frog to handstand progression of what's going to happen to try and press out. So at some point I'm going to go from my frog stand into my handstand. I've got to support all of my body weight on my hands because I've got to move into a new position. We talk about creating a stable shape from which you can move to the next pro progression. Our first stable shape in a handstand is our frog stand. Our second, second stable shape is going to be our upside down tuck handstand position or, or a chair. And I'll just show you what it looks like and then I'll show you the progressions. So I start in the same position, frog stand. I'm then going to work, and this is basically going to be just a strength position to move myself to here. That's now a pretty stable shape for me, and I can play around and just get my balance in those shapes. And then if I'm stable here, my job is quite straightforward. If I know where I'm in space, I've just got to straighten my legs. Rather than me thinking about coming through and trying to balance the end position so much neural stuff and information to try and control you're not for most people you're just not fast enough you know a system's not quick enough to pick the right selection or pick the right strategy to correct that shape so if we break it down to those neural chunks nail the frog stand move to the next progression nail that move to the next progression and then you can start to play around to sequence it together so the first step of that is can we now just, take one leg just off do, can I just we to go to go side on uh, just, just, uh, just so they can see a little bit of uh, when he waited that frog stand position. Just go, just go frog. And he was, we were talking about like balancing that position out. We want to try. The reason we wanted like the to go. What happens if we put the knees a little bit higher to get that hip higher? Is because he wants to get those hips completely stacked on top of the shoulders. The shoulders are forward of the pivot point of the hands, and the hips are behind. When we try to stack those hips right on top, the shoulders need to come into line as well. So just watch that as you just go through to that chair position. The hips come up and forward, but the shoulders come back. So we get this like little bit of rotation work. It's not just picking the bum up. Now the center of mass is stacked over the base of support. Yeah, he needs a tiny bit of counterbalance of the legs are behind, so the arm might be he might be slightly forward the, the shoulder position. That makes sense. And then we can try and straight. The last bit is just straightening those legs, but we're just trying to manage that center of mass above that base of support. It just, it takes time to build up the strength to do that, but it's also then just like the control. It's easier to balance there than it is with your legs completely up, because you've just got less stuff to, to manage. You know, we've brought those legs in, in tighter. Does that make sense? It feels a bit weird at the start, but it can then become a quite a comfortable position. Yeah. So first progression, guys, try and take one knee off. That's simple from that shape. So we're going to try and keep the hips high, push hard into the ground. Can I take one off? Put it back on. Take one off. Hip doesn't move. Put it back on. Hip doesn't drop anywhere. Yeah. And this is a strength issue of keeping that angle the same. If we're not strong enough to close that, you take one knee off, elbow drops, hips come down, feet back on the floor. So try and keep the hips high by pushing hard into the floor. Let's have a go. I'm just going to touch on very quickly how you bypass this stage if you want. And we don't want to get bogged down in it because it, it, it lends it. So I, I actually do a lot of my handstand practice by skipping this stage because I'm trying to preserve strength. So if you wanted to practice and get into that tuck position, but you need to earn the right to progress to be there, a lot of the time I do my handstand practice from here. And we can practice it against the wall when we go down. But I'm just going to bunny hop in from a straight arm shape position. So if you wanted to do that, just a last little progression on this to show you where some of the strength is going to come from because having some more straight arm strength is going to make it more um, stable foundation when you get into your handstand. Our crow position 
is going to be here, or crane, I think sometimes it's called in yoga. So we're trying to basically lock the elbow out, get the knees up onto the back of the triceps. That's going to give us some more strength, which is going to be beneficial when I come into my straight arm lockout position. Same principles, have a quick go at that, just you'll feel the difference between the two. Just rest those knees on the back of the triceps, try and lock the arms out. If, you're, if your arms bend, your brain is just telling you that you're much stronger in this middle position, so why don't you do it there? Okay. <laughs> Brain's not stupid. Um, so you have to work hard to keep it straight. All right, so we're all we're building some diversity from this bottom position. So we've got some ability to shift around in that frog stand. We've got some diversity there. We've tried some different surfaces and different positions. We've now taken one leg off. We've played with some straight arm positions. Your, the, the, the ultimate piece of this, and we'll show you a nice little progression how you can feel this transition from one movement to the next, is ultimately you need to get strong enough to take both off and keep the hip in the same position as, as Jacko yeah. mentioned before. And also shoulders. Tim mentioned that shoulder angle, we don't want that to drop. So when he takes both, if, you're going to take, if he takes both legs off, hip stays there and the shoulder angle doesn't change either. Yeah, what's, what will happen if we're not strong enough in the shoulders, we start to come down and we start, the, we start to bend more at the elbow, more at the shoulder, and even if you can hold yourself up, but when you're trying to do the transition, <laughs> you're going down when you're actually wanting to try and go up, but Tim can do handstand push-ups, so he can go to the bottom and, and push-up, but we want to think about where we're trying to get to and trying to, to do, make sure we're not doing the opposite. But it comes from a strength point of view. We need to make sure that we're, we're aware of those two things, keeping the hip high and keeping the shoulder in the same position as we're trying to go through. Uh, this transition. If we can't do those things, it's, it's a strength thing. It's a strength thing at the shoulders. And some of these progressions are taking one leg off, taking two legs off, uh, what we would call applied strength, like really specific to that position. You can't get sort of any more specific than being in the shape that you're trying to create. What we can't stress enough is the importance of strength in, in, in all of calisthenics. The reason, one of the reasons that my handstand progression has gone well is because I, I started with a reasonable amount of pushing overhead strength with a barbell perspective, but I did a lot of handstand push-ups from day one. I still do a lot of handstand push-ups against the wall now. And what that gives me is strength to play with. So rather than me being on the borderline of strength and also trying to execute a complex skill which my brain is still trying to learn, that's two things to worry about. Central nervous system is like, hang on a minute, you're not strong enough, you're not stable enough, so we've got problems. If I've got more strength than what I need, it frees up capacity for me to focus on the variables of controlling the skill. So you'll have seen when I did that, well you may have seen when I did the tuck handstand before, I'm making corrections in there because this is strong enough, I've got plenty of end range strength to control the position. If something goes wrong, or I want to play around with it just from an artistic perspective or do something a little bit different, I might want to kind of keep the hips high as we talk about and press straight back out, or I might want to bring them off, hold in here, and then start to think about pushing through. But the strength is there for me to be able to think about my balance and the control perspective of what I'm doing. So the, the, the message of that is strength can be less interesting than handstand skill practice. And a lot of people come in and practice kick up or I'm gonna do the balance, I'm gonna do the balance, I'm gonna do the balance. Okay, great, you need to do that time. What they then don't go and do is three sets of 10, four sets of eight of handstand push-ups or pike push-ups or a number of other different strength-based movements just to build the capacity to be able to push and hold a good shape. Strength underpins everything when it comes to this sort of stuff. You don't need a lot of strength to hold a handstand once you're there. To get there from that position, you do. If you want to bypass it all, kick up, fine. Choose what you want to do. What you're going to find is a kick-up handstand is going to give you very little transfer into any other hand balancing skills. You're going to get a kick-up handstand and it will look nice. If that's what you want to do, that's perfect. But if you've got ambitions to go and do something else with it, you're going to, at some point you have to earn the strength. So you might as well do that from the beginning. Right, so we're going to just do a little, little bit before we go down to the bottom about how we can help get through that, um, that transition. And Flavia, can I borrow you? Do you mind? I'm just trying to see someone that's okay on, uh, happy on um, frog stand. When you take both knees off, it feels like we're not strong enough to be able to maintain that shoulder angle I've just been watching and, like, and the hip coming down. So as a, I can provide us some assistance and spotting around the most difficult part to manage, her, her center of mass, so around her hips, to help her be Tim. 
and feel through that position. But I'm not going to do. Watch out. You've got, you've got to do the, you've got to do all the work. Don't rely on me. I will just provide the assistance you need. So it's not going to be like I'm going to pull you up into that shape. But we're going to, I'm just going to help guide and and give her little nudges where she needs it, rather than me. I'm not going to do the balance. I'm just going to help you figure, feel and find it out. So the process being, frog stand, happy with. Both knees are going to come off. We're going to do it step by step. So that chunking Tim was talking about, like rather than trying to do everything at once, we're going to break it down nice and simple. So frog stand, both knees come off and nice and in tight. Then you're going to uh, rotate that position so the chest is going to come through and the, and the, the hips are going to go up and straighten the arms. Yeah, okay. And we're going to, then you're going to finish in that position where you're upside down but your knees are by your chest. Yeah, in that tuck, yeah. So I'm just going to support on your hips, the center where you center master. So frog stand, both knees come off. Good. Wait to say. Good. Give her a little clap. <laughs> come down, come down. Okay. What what happened? We did a we did a handstand. What did we say we were going to do? We said we were going to stay in the tuck. But no, I'm not. No, no. It's a good example. So the legs did what they wanted to do. Like she didn't try to do that. The legs went and did what they wanted to do, their brain probably knows what the end result was trying to get to, uh, but also think that the legs, we're going to try and go up. So the legs going up in the same direction help everything go up, okay? So I want you to, I want you to slow it down and try and keep, and keep it. Remember, I can, I can add a little bit more help if you need it. We'll, we'll just go, let's go one more time. It's state, you're going you're gonna to maintain that position the whole time, yeah? So we can go super slow because I can help even more if you need it. So knees come, knees off, knees stay tight, stay, keep, the keep the knees in, 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 keep the knees a little bit more. Good, we'll come down, nice, give it a little clap. <laughs> and you'll see, do you see the angle of the shoulder, the, particularly those that were side on, that we're, the, the arm wasn't completely vertical, we were at a bit of an angle to counterbalance where the legs were because the knees were bent, but what was the hip like? The hip was more open rather than flexed. And this is an example where um, if Flavia were, w watches a film back, if she's training on her own or with a partner, but watches the video back to see what shape she's making and realizing, okay, actually, I thought I was in here, flex knee, flex hip, but actually I was flex knee and open hip. Just because when we're upside down, we're disorientated. We don't actually know quite what the body shape it is. Uh, that we're making. So watching a video back of yourself can be really helpful. The, th the reason being that if that right, because that was open, there was so much weight distributed backwards with the legs that the shoulder angle had to be forward. Yeah, I couldn't let go of her, otherwise we were going to come down. Yeah. So one thing we're going to, thank you for here. One thing, we're going to look at like how we can do some of those things um, with a band when we go down into the gym. The last little thing we're going to do is show you, and Rain, we had a chat about this last night when you were talking about your straddle up of, of it feels like I haven't got the strength, a lot of the time we get the question, it feels like I haven't got the strength in my, my core, my glutes to like lift my, lift my legs and my hips up. But you know, we can lift our legs up easily when we're supported by the floor. The problem is the we're being supported in our handstand and our frog stand by purely our shoulders. That's all that's really supporting us, our shoulders and our arms. If I can create an easy position strength-wise, but remember strength being underpinned by stability. If I'm not stable and I'm worrying about the balance and haven't got the balance, the brain's gonna wind back the strength I've got. I actually can't create strength if I haven't got the stability. Does that make sense? If it feels all wobbly. So, can I create an easy position from a strength perspective and give myself some more stability and then take out the strength and balance aspect that I need from the shoulders and hands, but work on literally the latter part of the position. So my, that would be coming then from my headstand. I'm going to make a headstand then becomes nice and specific to our frog stand. If I show you side on, our frog stand, my head and shoulders are way forward of my hands. My head is literally in line with probably there. So I'm going to then place my head down on the floor. I'm going to then put my knees on my, uh, so yeah, my knees on my elbows, and I'm trying to push down through the floor. Don't, don't feel like you're resting every, all the pressure on your head. My job is there. Can I create a position where my, 
uh, center of mass is above my base support, so my hips are above that base support that's now a triangle of my head and my hands. Can I take both knees off? And can I then rotate and get that trunk into that position? And just get comfortable doing that aspect of it. When you get that center of mass above that base support, you're gonna feel like, my legs actually feel almost weightless. You can then practice also, what is it like to take the legs straight up to the ceiling, get those butt, get that bum on, get that core on, and feel what that straight body line is like, and coming down. But when you'll also, <laughs> the caveat is, when you haven't got that center of mass stacked above the base of support, just like in the frog stand, if that center of mass is backwards, Everything's gonna feel super heavy and you're fighting gravity rather than stacking those things on top. We'll do it with a partner to stop you going. What you don't wanna do is bail out over the top. So we'll have a partner, we'll do this partner sister. So if, if Tim was being my partner, he'd be here making sure my legs don't go over the top. But equally, if you're ever doing this sort of thing on your own, there is a bail out of a roly poly that isn't scary. But when you, if you're gonna go over the top, you might go, oh, you might do something a bit a bit funky, but there is a forward roll option for those that have a forward roll in the locker. Yeah? Guys, one thing I'd about to just notice for a few of you, and I, I tend to do the same, it depends on how sort of uber strict you want to get with it and, and how much you want to do your headstand. Typically when I headstand, I'm probably going to be on a slight angle, um, partly because of where it feels comfortable on my head, the head position. You can go vertical if you want to go vertical, and it's a slightly different sort of yoga position, potentially like moving away from a triangle into more of like an elbow, um, position or forearm position stand but we were just saying, saying to Dan before that and, and Doug that if we go that triangle position is not a bad place to get comfortable with because if you want to go from a strength handstand push-up that's the shape that we're going to need to get into so when you do a handstand push-up you're basically going into the bottom of your headstand but you're then just driving yourself back out because you're creating that three-point triangle as you drop into shape and then driving back through but ultimately with all of this like again it goes back to what Jacko was saying around the different positions the more variability that you have in your different progressions that we've shown you today, the better that's going to be for the robustness of the skill that you're going to end up with. So practice some on an angle, film them and see where you are. Try and get a little bit straighter and see what it feels like. Don't be worried about what the perfect technique looks like. The brain isn't interested in perfect technique. What the brain is interested in learning is generally applicable movements. It doesn't want a thousand different techniques. For the principle that it takes far too long for it to run through that encyclopedia of things or the filing system to find the right one. If you create, if you stick to generally applicable movements and with variability within them, the brain is gonna become much more um, interested and also able to fire the right movement pattern. Because it downloads that rather than thinking what is perfect. Perfect is useless. Running technique for this, from a survival perspective, which the brain is interested in, running perfect on a track is of little interest if, if all of a sudden for your survival you've got to run up that bank because the surface is completely different, the angle and gradient is completely different. So running needs to also follow the same principles of generally applicable movement that can be used in a number of different environments. It's why, um, just to finish that off, why we know, we know a push-up because you've all done push-ups before and when you're a baby, you crawl, so you know what that's like. Where am I strong in my push-up? I'm strong midpoint in my push-up. A frog stand, my every, if you just ignore what my legs are doing, my frog stand is the same as my push-up shape. So like, it's one of those, those options that you've already got in the tank. When we go down there now, and we look at the top down, kicking up to handstand, if you've never done it before, you have nothing, your brain has no um, idea of the shape that you're trying to create and it's trying to then figure out which one of these generally applicable things that I've got in my locker does it sort of feel like and for those that have done it for a bit you'll feel a bit more comfortable those that haven't done a lot of it it feels so alien that you don't really know what's going on whilst we're up there um, so we've got to try that's why we sort of teach it from this it makes sense why we teach it from there first and get us into that type of shape and then we can build it all from that starting point all right, guys, so, everyone here? Uh, yeah. Sweet. Um, so, we're gonna have a look at this. So, we, we've, we've done the top down. No, we haven't, we've done the bottom up. We're now gonna look at the top down, and we're gonna do a little piece on linking the, the two things together in the middle. Um, so, we're gonna use the wall for some kick-ups. Has, has anyone not done a kick-up handstand before? I've tried. 
because you guys don't talk to me, has anybody, <laughs> would anybody like me to show you a kick up handstand? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you guys to do. Um, there's two ways to get into it. We'll show you them both. Oh, you, Jackie, you can take it. So, a kick up, a kick up allows us to get against the wall, and the wall's going to support the feet from going actually over the top. So, you could, the easiest way we feel like is using this, the back leg as a pendulum, the front leg as your kicker. It's a bit like a track start position. What he's trying to do is keep that back leg straight, that touches the wall, the other one comes to join it. The, the hands have to be a little bit away from the wall to give your head some space to actually be through. But what that does is, it, lets, it means that you end up in this slumped position where your feet are a little bit further forward from where your hands are on the floor. And what Tim's got to do to straighten that up is push the shoulders through, suck the belly button in, and then try and push his feet as high as he can. See how that extra raise that's coming from the shrug of the shoulders. That's all coming from the shoulders. Looking at the point on the floor in between your hands to give yourself a little bit of a reference point. Look through your eyebrows, not just turning your neck. If you extend your neck, that's gonna make you extend your spine and then you get back into that slump position, yeah? That's kick up um, and using the wall that way around. We can use the wall the other way around and this progressively lets you get more upside down as a walk up. To link the two things together, Jacko was talking about motor learning before. We know a push up, right? So, if your brain is uncomfortable with going up over the top, it doesn't have a movement pattern to link that movement to. So, this is a really easy place to go. Can you do a push up? Yep. Can you do that? Yeah, we know this position. So, we progressively take over now, Jacko. Yeah, so progressively walk further back until you get to a point where you feel comfortable. Ideally, we want to use a nice straight wall that's going to teach us where straight is. So we don't have to worry about that slump position with the feet over the top. Now the feet are supported by the wall here. Tim pushes through, he can get his nose to touch the wall. And then when his job, you know, the other way around, talked about making ourselves long, pushing the feet towards the ceiling, but sucking that belly button off the wall. If he gets good in this shape, he can create that nice hollow body position so that all that's touching the wall is his feet and potentially his nose, but everything else is just a smidge line away from it. Rather than being slumped there and touching the wall, is going to try and get everything away from the wall. Nice cue to think about in your head is trying to be push your feet towards the ceiling. Think about being strong and long. Create length through through your body. The um, the kick up one. I'll just the kick up is nice in terms of being able to practice some balance. So I'm going to just look and talk to you, but I want you looking at the through your eyebrows through the the space uh, between your hands. But I'm going to be able to take one leg off the wall. Create that better shape there as I can. And then I, this allows me to practice some balance where I can just either tap the foot or eventually swap them. Look at the and floor. slower, I swap them. Eventually I can start to swap them and bring them together. That allows you to practice your balance without worrying about your feet smashing off against the wall. Uh, your feet going over the top of you doing a body slam. So, Use the wall as a safety net, but try to use it less and less and less as you get more and more confident. Yeah, you can yes, the ask the question. <laughs> yeah. So doing a having a have a have it. We need a bailout. Don't leave it to uh, you, don't leave do a walk, it to, from a walk up position or from a kick up. We we'll do both. The idea of always have a have a way you're going to go. You're either going to go left or you're going to go right. There's going to be one that feels more natural than the other. And it's basically like half a cartwheel. So don't be, you feel like you're falling, when we're, how am we going to come down? Don't leave it to choice, how am we going to go left or right? You know already, and actually practice coming down onto one side, but just half a cartwheel out. You can do the same um, the other way. So leg down to the side, I think if half a cartwheel. If that feels scary, just intentionally go up and practice it. Yeah. And you'll realise that actually you can get your hands on the floor, or your feet on the floor with your hands still on the ground. It's, it's not scary. We haven't got loads of space, so if we're going to do that, just make sure we're not going to kick somebody next to us. We're practicing these. This phase takes time. The wall is your best friend in terms of learning that freestanding handstand positions. Too often people move away from the wall into free space because they think this time I'm going to get it. Next time, no, next time I get it. Next time. <laughs> Two or three, four, five of those attempts in a session are good. The majority of the time should be spent here because the important thing from a skill acquisition is time on task. Like you have to give yourself or your, your brain the opportunity to have enough time to learn what it's supposed to do. And if you're constantly falling over and kicking back up, you never rack up enough deliberate practice to make any sort of realistic change. 
Don't be in a rush to run before you can walk. This is like we talk about calisthenics and ego, and this is a massive ego one for people. Have a play. Handstand session. We've done a bit up at the temple where we're looking at the bottom up, where we build it up from a frog stand and the, the strength progression it is to get there. But what we need to do, if we're going to do this frog tan stand, not only do we need the strength to get up to the top, we need to get once we get up to the top, we need to have the balance and the control to be able to hold that end position. So we're using the wall both ways around, kicking up and walking up just to, to teach us one, the, the body line, the body position, supported by the wall or assisted by the wall um, for that end position, and then having a chance to practice what is the balance like by taking one leg or, or two legs off. You guys are doing a great job. Nice doggy. We're going from here. To, for her to move those hips on top of the, her base of support, that has got to go that way. That rotation has got to happen. Oh, and there you go. Whereas a lot of us are maintaining the same position at the shoulder and through the back here and trying to get their hips on top. We have to allow that to happen. That makes sense that we can't, nothing, something can't rotate, the top bit can't go up until you let this bit come through. And that bit coming through is that happening, yeah, as you're straightening through the arms. Otherwise, if you don't let that happen, you're blocking the rotation, yeah? If, you, if I had like a hammer or something, I was trying to move that bit up, like if I fix that piece, it won't go. It only rotates when the other side comes with it. So it, it just it feels impossible and you don't let that rotation happen. The big thing that's stopping a lot of all of this from going on is strength. The right is strength. The reason we're using a band is because strength. And we'll go through, we'll have like one last minute and then we'll just go through some of the strength work that's so, so important. That, that phrase Tim said before about having strength in abundance. So you don't have to worry about, have I got the strength to push out of there? I can focus on all of the control we need to spend some time getting strong and I wish I could give us all a special magic touch and you're just stronger enough to do it but you've got to earn that yeah so the final piece of the puzzle that we've talked about so we've gone through this whole session has been a, a nice sort of example of what our framework looks like we did our movement preparation phase at the start we then did our movement patterning phase of starting to learn the shapes that we need to get into some of this stuff then crosses into applied strength, strength which is specific to the movement that you're looking to do. And there's a bit of a, there's always a, a bit of a, um, a crossover between movement patterning and applied strength, and there, there absolutely should be because at some point we need to take a movement skill progression and we need to make that stronger. So those two things are going to sit quite well together. So, for example, a frog stand could be movement patterning to start off with. If I go into my frog stand and I'm hanging out, what I'm then going to try and do, if I want to make it more like an applied strength perspective, is I'm going to try and push as hard as I can for 10 seconds. And you're going to see when I do that now, I'm going to shake as I'm trying to create force. It's an isometric hold. So as I get in here, I'm going to push, 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 as if I'm going to try and get my hands off. So there, the difference between this being, oh, okay, I get what I'm supposed to do, versus I'm actually now trying to create force, is where we change the focus from movement patterning into applied strength, but it's the same position. And handstand days sort of mirror quite closely. With other movements, it's, it's probably more of a distinct yeah. difference. Just go into that position one more time. So that Tim's so strong that his that's. knees are actually coming off his legs. But that the intent needs to be there that that's what you're trying to do. When you don't just just go into just just literally the frog stand position. The applied part of this is look where the shoulder the shoulder is in relation to the hand and the head in relation to the shoulder in relation to the hand. We need to build strength in that shape. So, uh, so our, um, our frog stand, there's nothing more specific for a frog stand than a frog stand, so that's building strength there, but what about in terms of actually generating so some, our, our, our reps and sets, some, some concentric, some eccentric work in and out of these positions. So that's where our pike push-ups and our handstand push-ups are needing to make sure that we are making them specific enough to the movement pattern we're trying to create, because that shoulder being in front of um, of your hand, this distance that you end up creating is a lever arm that means it's way, way, way more hard, difficult than if you were in here. If I was doing a barbell shoulder press or dumbbell shoulder press, I'd be doing it here. If I was standing and doing it like this, you'd get put on Facebook or whatever under like gym, you know, there's <laughs> people that are taking the mick out of you because you'd say it's not right, but it's what we're actually trying to do, for, what we need for this thing. We start here, we push and we, then we finish and come through into that nice, straighter position, but we must make sure these, uh, these exercises have that element to them. 
Yeah. So a pipe push up, we start from your push up position that we all know, stick the bum and the hips as high as we can. We want to try and make this vertical, you're pressing out vertically, but depending on your hamstring flexibility is going to affect that. We're going to have a slight angle on the trunk because the feet are on the floor, but look at the same as Tim goes, that's his top position, head makes triangle the hands, shoulder ends up going forward of the elbow, and elbow is stacked vertically on top of the wrist, that's where we want to get the type of shape we want to get into. We don't want to take the, ha the head straight between the hands, one, because it's not going to build strength in the movement that we're trying to create, but two, it flare, the elbows flare out to the side. When the elbows flare out to the side, head of the humerus goes rocketing to the front of that shoulder joint where you've got all that lovely, nice tissue that you don't want to be impinging. So that not only is a bad position, it's not helping us what we're going to do. So we're going to, same as the frog's done right at the beginning, Tim talked about screwing the shoulder and elbow so it starts to point more backwards in sort of 45, keeping us in a good position, but building a strength in the shape we're trying to create. With feet go up, then we get the chance to now, now we're vertical, yeah? The more vertical we are, the more load we're putting in through the shoulders, but we must still make that triangle shape. So as we go, we're vertical, as we go down to the bottom, we have a slight angle. It's the same if you want to get what Tim was talking about, handstand push-ups, we need to create that slight angle position. But head, shoulder, elbow, all exactly the same as we're trying to do in our frog to handstand. The last vertical difficult position is let's not have the feet on the floor uh, on the box, let's have the feet up straight above us. The little bit of the feet sliding on the wall means you don't have to worry about the balance and that creates a little bit of stability to the movement. So therefore you can focus then on the strength element of it. Um, one thing that we're sort of big on at the moment for to really make this even more specific, not in terms of the technique, but in terms of the tempos that you use. Your frog stand is a static hold, right? No momentum, no movement. You're going from a completely uh, static position to then a concentric force to push you up. So if we want to make these super specific and it makes it flipping 10 times harder, is you come down, you pause at the bottom with your nose just hovering off the floor, and then you press up. But we don't press up fast, so we pause. Then can we, have we got strength coming out of that dead position? If he pushes up more slowly, so just do a slow one on the web, so he pauses and he comes up slowly. Why is coming up slowly beneficial from a strength perspective in this? More time on the tension. Uh, yes, we're creating more time and tension, but what's, what's, what's the relevance to the handstand? What happens when you push out up real fast in your frog handstand? It's like pausing, isn't it? Yeah, so you lose your balance when you go fast, but it's hard to go slow. So think about when you're there, not only do your feet want to do that, your brain is like, let's do this thing fast, Jacko, or Doug, or whatever. But let's do it fast. And it's harder to go slow, but you need to go slow so you don't lose your balance. So we need to train that element of the strength. If anyone's ever done like, we used to end up doing some like five second, like 10 second reps, five second eccentric and five second concentric in, because we had a horrible trainer when I was playing rugby. But it's brutal. Like you would go from being able to do what weight you can do for 10 reps, it's like you can now do four. Um, and you haven't changed anything other than just how slow you're going. Yeah. Have a play with those guys. So try the isometric hold with, with high tension. Try some frog stands on the floor if you feel they're going good. Elevate your feet slightly. The higher the box, the more difficult it becomes. And if you're king dingling, get up <laughs> against the wall. Um, that's the last bit we're we'll doing. And then we're going to break. break time. And yeah. human flag. I think. As you can see, when you do good, like I can do like five of the tight yeah. push ups. Is that, is that good? Or is that, is that good? No, I want 10. We, we, don't, we tend There's not no to work on numbers, arbitrary but... numbers, but there comes a base level of going like, so it's not like, some people go, when you do 10 pull-ups, you can do a muscle-up. It doesn't work like that. But 10 of those was a basic level that shows you've got a decent amount of capacity, because what's going to happen when you go from 10 onto the box, you're going to probably drop to five, like Jacko was saying with the weight. So if you go, if you've only got five on the floor, when you go to the box, you're probably only going to get one. Yeah. And then one's not going to be enough for you to build up. Yeah. Of strength. Patient. Yeah, go. Yeah, you can do it the other way around. It's tricky in terms of like you do. You have to do the wall walk up yeah. to get into it. You can skip into it. Um, again, like they are. I've I've started using more of that face position, facing the wall, for because I'm specific looking for my hands and push up strength. So it's a it's a more specific position. Um, I just find it. It's a, if I'm just trying to put volume in the program, it's a more awkward. 
position. I can get more reps than like that. So then the, my programming decision comes down. Am I talking capacity strength? Just I need some reps and sets. Or am I talking applied strength? It's specific to what I'm trying to work towards. Um, you can get to a point where you're doing volume in that position as well. Um, but it's just, uh, well, try. It's yeah. harder, like it keeps, you, it keeps you way straighter and stricter, which then, yeah, so then you might, you might be at that position where you can't do five, you end up only doing one, and it's actually, you need to, you need to build, yeah, you need to build up to be able to do that. And I think honestly as well, like the, the kick up version, if you can, it's always gonna look a little bit bent, but I'm fighting to keep tight, is a more pure vertical push because of the nature where the feet are going. If I walk up and I'm gonna come down forwards, it's gonna be more like on a slight angle, which is what a handstand push-up is gonna be. But if I want pure vertical, which is what we a lot of people need more strength in, then um, I think the kick-up is a, is a good option. Again, so neither, neither wrong or right, based on the programming decision of, of what it is that you want to achieve, but both have merit. Good question. Cool. Have a quick play, guys, and then we'll um, we'll wrap for a quick break, and then if you want a snack or anything, then we'll crack on with the second session.